Well, hello again, everyone. This is Chris Joslin, your host for another edition of Jaws Bites, coming to you and represented by, uh, sponsored by uh, iLevelLogistics.com, probably coming across your screen right now, where we curate and aggregate information in the supply chain industry specifically for you, designed to initiate conversation, feedback on YouTube, on any platform, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. So come, give us some likes, give us some feedback. This is designed to initiate conversation and to broaden the scope of people's understanding of the logistics industry and to help us learn as well. We don't sit here and claim to know everything, though we'd like to think so sometimes. But uh, without further ado, I I, want to make sure and let everyone know we have a very special guest today. Uh, This gentleman has been in the presidential position for CNK Holdings probably for about 20 years, I believe. Uh, he'll probably get into that a little bit. But CNK Holding owns at least three entities that I'm aware of right now. CNK Trucking, which is one of the largest intermodal, uh, intermodal trucking uh, companies specializing in the drayage of containers and trailers between the ports, the railroads, and the shippers in a very safe and efficient manner with close to, I believe, about a thousand drivers. They also own AV Logistics, which provides comprehensive international domestic container management services, as well as a variety of intermodal services throughout the United States with a real pension and a passion for detail. That's part of the, one of the main things I believe that makes this company and this set of companies stand out from others is their ability to communicate detail and information to their clients, both internal and external. To get information and process it and communicate is is more than half the battle. They also own now a a kind of an agency model truck over the road trucking company with over 300 drivers called Skyline Express. So there's a broad scope of things that they're invested in 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 the industry. And Mr. Mike Burton has cordially uh, said yes to coming on and and, uh, sharing with a little with us a little bit, which is behind kind of the curtain for him, so, so a mind of someone that's been in the logistics and really a numbers cruncher over the course of the last few decades. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Mike Burton. podcast and and you know hopefully we can peek behind the veil of a of an expert that's been doing this for quite some time i hate to ask you how long but, but oh, it's yeah. but that's years. the first question how long have you been doing years. this 19 oh, years 19 years so i've got you beat i'm i'm going close to 30 now believe yeah. <laughs> and of course from my hairline you can tell that's the fact so <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but I, i'll I, tell you one thing though this is one of those industries that keeps you on your toes you know what I mean? It, there's always something. You know, we were talking just before I hit hit record there, and you were saying that it's like putting out fires constantly, right? Yeah, yeah, just always something. Yeah. Always. Listen, there's never a lack of things to do. That's for sure. Right. Exactly. And you know, I I uh, I was in in the introduction. I was commenting about your CMK Holdings and some of the the affiliated companies that you have associated with that. The newest of which I think is called Skyline, right? So, right. Um, it, it's you, you're broadening your umbrella of of things that your group is going after and looking at. But is your is your core competency, your focus, really primarily on the drayage side of things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all really about making drayage easier. We do it from on the logistics side, you know, with the team there that they're just trying to make it easier to help the customers manage the whole process and get better control of it and get better visibility to actually doing the drayage, whether it be through Skyline or through C&K trucking and just making it easier. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's it's funny. As long as we've been doing this, the, the kind of the soft spot in the industry is kind of the touch point for your customers, either the pickup or the delivery. And, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about trucking, think about the long haul aspect of things, you know, the cross country guy going from coast to coast and, 
you know, spending weeks on the weeks on the road and doing all that kind of thing. It's kind of the nostalgic U.S. kind of thinking process with trucker. But the lion's share of trucking is done on the regional or even the, the local side. And that's where drayage comes in and is so important. And there's, you know, whether it's a 53 foot container or whether it's a 40 foot or a TEU or an FEU coming into and out of the coast. I mean, that's that's where the rubber meets the road, really, in, in our industry today especially with the mess we have going on in the ports and the terminals and things that are happening now. What do you think is, from your perspective, the primary um, primary place we need to put our energy into? You know, the, I, I think that the, the biggest area that we need to figure out is how to solve the chassis problem. And the chassis problem being that, you know, there are certainly um, a shortage of chassis in the marketplace and there's not enough manufacturers and um you know china is no longer manufacturing really chassis for us given the you know the tariffs and the penalties that got put in place right that equate to you know close to three times what a chassis cost you know i think mm-hmm. it's 238 percent plus the original tariff and so you know the combination of those things has resulted in you know the lack of us to add chassis capacity to solve this problem the only other way that we see it you know improving is through what we don't want to see which is some type of a recession uh yeah slow down for whatever reason it may be and you know obviously if that happens you know we can get caught back up and things will settle down but you know we we don't want that to happen so my my suggestion is that the only real solution is to to get more chassis and then let the market you know dictate how to fix it from there which really is to create off-site additional capacity to be able to uncongest the you know the facilities well you know i don't know what the ratio is chassis to containers but you know it's i think it probably is dependent on the geography of where you're at the need you know, certainly of the types of chassis, et cetera. And, and, and of course, is there is there enough chassis sharing going on? But I, I think what I've seen in the industry, and maybe you can you can either confirm or or go in a different direction with this, but I've seen a lot more people actually, um, in, in, you know, bringing on their own sets of chassis to take out of the equation, renting or leasing so many all the time, though it's always going to be part of the equation. Yeah, I mean, listen, we 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 have more and more pro- dedicated programs that we're putting in place for our customers, and that's mainly because they don't want to run into problems again where they can't have the freight delivered because they don't have the chassis. The penalties of not being able to deliver your freight on a timely basis oh. is huge compared to the cost of the, the chassis. And right. so, you know, it's not it's not just a factor of okay well we have to merge we have to pay or you know we have some additional per diem but it's uh, lost sales there (laughs) you go delays with labor of not having the freight delivered and not being able to schedule appropriately you know all those extra costs that get added in that's really having a material impact you know know what's funny is that uh, i think you hit on it kind of one of the most important subjects that isn't talked about really and that's those i hate to call them soft costs but they're not addressed as you know you look at the per diems and the demerge and all these other things or the associated cost of mnr and things like that repair on chassis or or your or your trucks etc people fail to consider a lot of times the extended cost of not having something on the shelf when your competitor does right so if the the analytics people of the world at these big retail places and things like that have got a handle on that. You know, they, they understand that if there's something either that's on their website or in their brick and mortar store and it's not available to the public in general when it needs to be, well, it's a lost sale or it's a sale that's going to transfer to somebody else. And the cost of having a, a company like yourself that has a dedicated amount of equipment to something it might be a little more expensive on this on the front end but on the back end it makes up for it quite a lot but and that, and that's what we're, what we're trying to communicate to our to our customers on offering different solutions and even then 
that's not going to solve all the solutions, but it's going to help alleviate one of the big bottlenecks in, in, in our in our supply chain. Uh, you know, everyone's congested um, and, you know, you know, everyone's going to stacked operations and the problems with that is when you're full, it takes forever to get in and out. So your capacity is cut in half. Everyone talks about the driver shortage, you know, mm -hmm. and a physical with my doctor and he says, oh, yeah, the big problem is the driver shortage. I go, no, no, it's not the driver shortage. <laughs> yeah, it's the driver productivity, which cuts Here you go. the capacity of the driver in half. We have more drivers out now than we had pre pandemic. Yeah, you know, I was doing some reading on that the other day, and I think he even mentioned on one of my previous podcasts, just recent ones that I did, talking about the driver shortage. And there's, you know, you can look up white papers on this from MIT transport labs and things like that. But when you have your, when your shoes are on the ground looking at this stuff, it becomes immediately apparent that if you can't get somebody on the road for a little bit longer time, then you're pulling capacity out of everything. And you, you exacerbate that with this chassis issue. And, you know, I often I often think, you know, it, it, the, the attention has been drawn to the ocean ports, especially in Los Angeles and in Long Beach because of the, the lineup off the coast of these giant steamships. And I can't help but think that a lion's share of that, maybe not a lion's share, maybe I'm going too far with that, but a big portion of that challenge is because of the things you've already mentioned. Just to elaborate oh. a little further on the question, I, you know, my thinking of ports, you know, the term itself is very, you think about it as a geographic point, but it's also an interchange of economies, right? You, different foreign economies to our economy and vice versa, depending on right. ingress yeah. or egress. And again, I know there's no magic bullet, but from your perspective, if we increased efficiencies, would you look at the equipment side like we were talking about on the chassis, or would you look at the ports efficiencies or maybe maybe the 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 land bridge effect going to the rails? What is what is because you're in all of these, you know, your AV logistics, your C and K trucking, your Skyline Express, all these things kind of have focal points either at rail terminals or ports. At least that's the way I view it. Maybe, maybe I'm viewing it incorrectly. But from your perspective, if you were to take one of those and put all your attention just on that from an industry perspective, which would it be? You know, that's a that's that's a tough question to answer because there's so <laughs> many factors that, you know, if you do one thing with one, then it has another impact on another. I think what, you know, certainly there there are some things that you can do at the ports to improve productivity, right? Whether it's labor arrangements, whether it's additional capacity, whether it's new technology. Uh, and you see it in some of the ports throughout the world, how efficient they are versus maybe some of the U.S. companies. It's, that That's a piece of it. And we can look at that long. That's a long term solution. Mm -hmm. if, if we're going to continue to grow as an economy, which which the hopes are and the predictions are that we're going to continue, we'll have to we'll have to look at that. And then there's a whole issue of labor versus technology, you know, discussions, what's what's better. Um, so, you know, that that's one big area that would help alleviate and, and allow uh, the flow of uh, containers, you know, in, in and outbound uh, to go quicker. Yeah. You know, the, the, the second is the rail facilities and uh, um, throughout the U.S. on the inland side, you know, um, continuing to invest in technology and getting an adequate return so that you can do that is, is key. And having the focus back from operating efficiency to throughput. Operating right. efficiency means, you know, how do you maximize the money uh, and to the shareholders versus throughput, you know, has more of an impact of how do you help your customers. And I think the right. focus of the railroads over the last, you know, four to five years since the PSR has gone into play has, has caused a negative impact. So I think the railroads are turning things around and realize that they continue to, you know, they're, they're, they got about as much efficiency out as they can get. So now they have to get the throughput. Uh, and but I but I think they realize that the customers, you know, you know, they need to focus more on the customers and they're doing that. So I think that's a secondary. Right. Yeah, I think the pendulum does swing back and forth between those those kinds of things. And and, you know, focus internally, focus externally, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you mentioned stacking 
earlier. And that's a, a supply of actual land to use for parking and stacking and the efficiency it either takes away or draws into a into the whole supply chain in general. This, you know, it's one of the reasons I like this industry so well, is there are so many layers of complication to it and so many challenges about it, so many links in that supply chain. And it seems like when one of the links is, you know, supported and, and hardened in a way, another gets weaker and you just have to keep looking back and forth at all these things. It, so it's always very interesting to me. And one of the main things I really like about the last couple of years is there's been a a renewed focus on our industry. And it's going to be interesting to see in a few years what that, when we turn our heads around and look back historically to see how that's impacted the view of the industry as a whole and the importance that we all put on it. When you walk into a, a store and you're you're not able to buy your giant 20 pack of toilet paper, it, you know, people get, it gets people's attention, right? Oh, it does. Yes. Yes. And people are talking about it all the time now. And, yeah. you know, and, you know, the auto industry and, you know, the, the supply of chips and, uh, or the lack of supply of chips and some of it's supply chain related, some of it's pandemic related, some of it's combination. I, I thoroughly enjoy this kind of thing. Um, not because it's volatile right now, but because it's ever changing, you know, and the, the one thing I've noticed, I remember when the, the Suez Canal issue came into play, gosh, it's almost been a year now, right? And it, it had ramifications down the supply line, supply chain line, that really people hadn't thought about it, in the thought about it until something like that happens. So the, the, the thing I wonder is, you had mentioned at the very start of this conversation, we need more assets, we need more chassis, which I think if if it could be accommodated in the way you're talking about, would have a beneficial effect on other parts of the supply chain. So it's oh, like yeah. you got to start somewhere where those assets are in. Yes, you want to use them more efficiently. Yes, all those kinds of things are true. But you first at least have to what, what, what was the old field of dreams? You know, build it and they will come, right? You've got to build those chassis and then the freight will be able to start flowing better. You know, and it'll be more of a hardened supply chain, if you will, instead of such a fragile thing. And there's a lot of other uh, political and uh, factors that come into play, you know, related to, you know, overseas production, you know, whether it be China, Vietnam, other countries and you know, whether, you know, what we want to do, you know, it would be wonderful if we could build more capacity here in the U.S., right? Oh, sure would. I know some people are trying to do that, and there is some additional capacity. It's just, uh, you know, it's 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 difficult. And then we have the labor issues on top of it and, and the, the additional costs uh, related to it that, you know, is, is going to continue to be an issue to the reason why it should be considered from overseas production. Yeah, and at the end of the day, and, and you know this being a numbers person, at the end of the day, all these different things we're talking about, whether it's the efficiencies gained through new technologies or whether it's the, you know, the quote unquote driver shortage, whether you believe it's real or a figment of our imagination or just a figment of, of not having enough efficiency and, and all the upward costs from international shipping to domestic shipping to even the drainage components. All this thing has to filter down into the cost of the goods you and I buy at the store. Exactly. It has to. Right. And I, I was I was mentioning this the other day to somebody about a, uh, a a company that containerizes blueberries and how their overall cost for sending this stuff back out again was like triple of what it was. And I, I mean, OK, that superfood's going to cost me a little bit extra from now on. <laughs> and that, that's one of those things that it's going to be hard because transportation in general has been kind of, as far as a cost element, over the last 20, 20 odd years, it's, there's been some sameness. And now there's an opportunity for companies like myself and yourself to look at that and say, okay, we got to see what the market can bear because we have extra costs we have to adhere to. Right, right. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, hey, I didn't want to take a lot of your time today, but I wanted to, to you know, give uh, our growing audience a chance to to meet you and, and know who you were and, and get a little input from you. And I'd love to have you back again sometime in, in a more focused discussion on something. But sure. I know you're a busy, busy guy and you've got oh. a, a big umbrella of companies that you're 
you're having to make sure, you know, to dot the I's and cross the T's with. Well, fortunately, I got good people, so I rely on them, and it makes it a lot easier for me. But, but uh, yeah, anytime, any questions, or I'd love to bounce ideas off because uh, we learn something every time we get together. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Mike. I appreciate it. Good talking. All right. So thanks once again to Mike for popping by for a short visit and a chat and, and giving us some insight into some of the things that he finds uh, very important in the logistics supply chain industry today, especially with focus on the dredge. Come visit us at ilovelogistics.com. Be part of the community. Be part of the communication back and forth. Let us learn while you learn. That is a very important mission of ours and one we intend to grow as the community grows. Thanks again and looking forward to seeing you next time on another edition of Jaws Bites.